Good afternoon. Welcome to the BSI webinar, Enabling Trustworthy AI. Next slide, please. So this is a listen-only webinar that is being recorded. We'd like the webinar to be as interactive as possible and welcome questions that you may have via the Q&A function. We'll be having one large Q&A session after all the speakers are presented today. To help me and the speakers, please keep your questions as clear and concise as possible. To pose a question, simply click on the Q&A button in the side panel and post your question. Also, thank you to those of you who submitted your questions in advance of the conference. If you experience technical difficulty at any time, please submit your technical issue in the Q&A function and our technical support team will assist you. At the end of the conference, you will be taken automatically to a feedback survey to complete. The recording of today will be made available afterwards too. This is a CPD recognized webinar. Please request your certificate by the feedback survey following the webinar should you want one. Next slide, please. I am Tim McGar from BSI, the UK National Standards Body. I will be chairing the event this afternoon. This event is developed as part of the AI Standards Hub pilot, which we'll be hearing more about shortly. In addition, BSI runs regular artificial intelligence conference. The recordings of these and other uh, webinars are available from the BSI website. As most of you will know, artificial intelligence is an area of technology that is uniquely transformative for society, but also for economies. Given the economic benefits of AI, there is a huge rush by businesses um, and governments to reap the rewards of AI. Alongside this, given the huge potential societal impact, there is a widespread recognition from all stakeholders of the need to think ahead and build in best practice and appropriate regulation before the technology is ubiquitous. We've also seen a mainstream uptake in interest around AI since the launch of ChatGPT which has brought into the mainstream the debate around trustworthy AI that's been going on for a few years in the sector. Trustworthy AI is core to both realising economic benefits and ensuring the social impact of AI. If people don't trust AI, whether that's consumers or businesses, they won't use it and won't receive the benefits. Next slide, please. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the AI standards of itself, which some of you may already be familiar with. The AI Standards Hub has been developed in partnership between BSI, the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK Data Science and AI Lead, and the National Physical Laboratory, who are the UK Metrology Lead. The work also has the strong support of the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, and the Office for AI in the UK Government. The mission for the AI Standards Hub is to advance um, responsible AI by unlocking the potential of standards as a tool for governance and innovation, and to empower stakeholders to navigate the international AI standards landscape and become actively involved in it. The AI Standards Hub was first mentioned back in the UK AI National AI Strategy in, in 2021. Was, the website itself was launched in October 2022. If you go to aistandardshub.org, you can see it for yourself, but please wait till after the event today. The AI Standards Hub activities coalesce around four main pillars. The first pillar is an observatory. This is an AI standards database which tracks and displays relevant standards and standards development projects. It is accompanied by a database of AI-related policy documents from governmental and other official sources around the world. The second pillar is around community and collaboration. The hub serves as a home for the AI standards community, facilitating new connections, coordination, exchange of ideas and collaborative problem solving. The third pillar is around knowledge and training. The hub publishes e-learning modules and hosts training events. The final pillar, the fourth pillar, is research and analysis, including work we're doing on some very um, forward-thinking topics like AI sandboxes, which have been in the public domain a lot recently. There's a lot taking place in the current phase of the AI Standards Hub, and much of it is yet to be in the public domain, but it will be. It would take too long to describe all the activities that have been taking place, so I'll just cover some of the AI Standards Hub that's most relevant to today's webinars. I mentioned the Standards Observatory. This is a database covering the work of the national standards bodies, including BSI, 
the European Standards Organisations of SENS and LECNETSI, and internationally ISO IEC, the ITU and IEEE. And the database is updated regularly. For, as an aside, from BSI's perspective, most of the standardisation we are doing relates to AI sits in SEN, SENLEC, ISO and IEC, which is where we work regionally and internationally primarily. Later on, we'll hear from David and Wael about to give some more insight into the standardisation that's taking place. I mentioned about the e-learning. On the AI Standards Hub, there are three e-learning modules introduce standardisation and assurance specifically to an AI audience. So please go there if you want to hit, learn more about that particular topic and also around metrology and around AI itself. Also on the AI Standards Hub, there are materials to provide insights into the key standards, such as the forthcoming Artificial Intelligence Management System, ISO IEC 42001 which is really set to raise the bar around AI. And in the pre-submitted questions, we had quite a few questions around that. And just to reference, that will be publishing roughly around the end of uh, late summer this year, and went out for public comment last year. The other interesting standard that's recently come out is ISOAC 23894 around risk management for AI, which came, as I say, came out a few weeks ago. Another initiative as part of the AI Standards Hub is around international collaborations. For today, I notably want to mention Canada. Canada, like the UK, is at the forefront of many digital topics. We'll hear more about the pioneering work that's been undertaken by the Standards Council of Canada, or SCC, shortly. We've been in conversation with SCC for a while about their work. and We took a slightly different approach in the UK, given the different circumstances. So we've been working with certification bodies to increase their input into the recent public comment period for the ISO IEC 42001 standard I mentioned earlier. This has been really um, a pioneering piece of work and details of it will be available on the AI Standards Hub shortly. But it really will help um, ensure that the certification body expertise is brought into a standard that organisations can use to get external certification against should they choose to. Very person today, each of the AI Standards Hub partners has been doing a deeper dive into the theme of trustworthiness. So MPL has been looking at uncertainty, the AL Insuring Institute has been looking at explainability, we've been doing a deeper dive into resilience, security and safety. Now each of those topics under trustworthiness, BSI has a lot of standards around and expertise. So in terms of resilience, there, there are widely used standards around the world, around risk management, and business continuity, etc. In security, there's lots of standardization around cybersecurity and privacy, and safety is probably the most important thing around standardization. And my colleague Jill will be giving us a deeper dive into some of the recent findings in, in a webinar later on. And for all those parts of trustworthiness, there are materials from all the partners, and I recommend you look at them after the webinar. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of some of the work that's been happening in the AI Standards Hub. So after the webinar, please take a look at it and register up for the newsletter. Um, and as I mentioned, there'll be much more, res there'll be much more uh, content coming on there very shortly. So today we have a set of great speakers. The speakers will be introduced in turn when we come to their presentations. If you want to learn more about any of our speakers, all their biographies are available on the website. As I mentioned, we will do one Q&A section after all the speakers. So please submit your questions as we're going through. And I'll, I'll combine these with the pre-submitted questions and the live questions when we get to the Q&A section. Next. next slide, please. So next up, we have, we have two speakers from the Standards Council of Canada. So SCC is doing some leading work on various digital, digital, digital subjects, including AI. And I'd highly recommend you go and take a look at the work they did on um, data governance a few years ago. So they again provides an overview of the pilot work they've been doing around 42,000 certification and some other interesting developments. So the two speakers we have for this section are Jacqueline McCoon, Senior Project Manager, and Tom LeBrun, Program Manager, Strategy and Stakeholder Engagement. Jacqueline, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tim. So good morning from the West Coast of Canada, and I know that we're spread out all across the world right now, so thank you for attending. What I will quickly be doing is going through what we're doing at the Standards Council of Canada from an accreditation side of the house, which is actually a pilot for the ISO IEC 42001, as well as some focus on the product side of what a conformity assessment scheme can look like for AI. 
I would like to set a high level because this world can be quite nuanced and very unique, but to give you an overview of what's going on a high level, we've got the accreditation at the top peak, which is where SEC sits for my branch. And then underneath that, we end up accrediting these conformity assessment bodies or certification bodies, which then go and issue certificates. So leveraging some standards at the top where we sit at SCC, we're using the ISO IEC 42001 draft standard to see how a conformity assessment body can leverage that to give out certificates. Since this is a fairly new environment having an ISO standard linked to AI, we're really interested in seeing what this can look like and specifically because it's a management system focus rather than a product focus, what does that mean? And the natural gap that occurs is management system is quite organizational level. So what about the actual AI tool? What about the AI product? And how are we gonna validate if that's mature, ethical and appropriate? go. So what this pilot high level is geared to do is feed some information upwards to the Canadian regulatory bodies and stress the importance of why it's good to have requirements, guidance, and certain criteria around AI management systems, as well as AI products, and the trickle effects of expectations. So if we're able to demonstrate the rationale and importance of having some requirements up to different regulatory bodies, then this voluntary standard environment that we currently exist in for this standard can hopefully become more mandated in a valuable way. Next, from the certification or conformity assessment body pool, how does this 42001 or adjacent standards help empower them to issue this meaningful tool instead of requirements to the wild west that is AI right now? How do we know what good looks like? How are we measuring those metrics? And how do our assessment teams, our certification bodies, feel in terms of having the confidence to go issue certificates and disseminate the bad actors from the cohort? And then at the very bottom end user, thinking of AI developers or organizations leveraging AI, how are they able to implement this into their organization? The use cases for AI is across the board and can be used for everything from predictive text or facial recognition or credit scoring models and then some. So how can we have a standard be high level that's appropriate but also use case specific? And that's what this pilot's geared to do. The way this is unfolding is we have Ernst & Young as our certification body uh, role. And what they're doing is leveraging the draft ISO IEC 42001, the AIMS standard requirements. They've extracted the requirements and are now going through this sort of trial uh, assessment, this trial certification, where they're going to ATB, their credit scoring model specifically, as well as their organization, and seeing how do you have policies, processes, et cetera, to align with 42001. And what we're doing as SEC in the background is taking aggressive notes on where the gaps exist, where the easy wins are, where use case specificity would be required, and where there are some things that are potentially unattainable for small to medium enterprises or for large organizations. So this very sort of sponge approach of absorbing all of the lessons learned while the standard is in draft and being in a position to add requirements and guidance as SCC to help support our ecosystem of certification bodies. Under that, the organization being certified, ATB, Alberta Treasury Branches, is a private bank out of one of our local provinces here. And what they're trying to do is see how does our organization meet the expectations of 42001 What's too general? What's too specific? And how would this be of value to our organization and similar organizations next? What we also recognize is ISO AIMS is very focused on the management system side of things. And this ends up being a very common hurdle for organizations wondering about product and product ethics and maturity and uh, privacy ramifications, et cetera. So what we've also done from the product side is use a, a company called Responsible Artificial Intelligence Institute, who has started to develop a conformity assessment scheme around product maturity in AI. 
So now we have ATB that's going through the management system stream um, based off of AIMS, and then we also have them going through credit scoring model process for their product using the Ray Conformity Assessment Scheme. Similar thing, big data aggregation, vigorous notes, and amazing lessons so far, so I'm happy to share about that more later. And high level for the pilot, because we know that any experiment is terrible if our sample size is only one organization and one certification body. The idea is to expand this. A pilot is a great playground for having large experimental, messy data aggregation and genuine learning. So what we're planning on doing in the next few months is expanding this to bigger use cases, different certification bodies, different applications, and seeing how this unfolds. And then hopefully, once, as Tim mentioned, the uh, ISO standard is released at, uh, late summer, we're hoping to roll this into a bigger program long term. But that's it for me, and I will pass it over to Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, so I'm here to present you uh, quickly the AI and Data st uh, Governance Standardization Collaborative that we're going to launch next Thursday on March uh, the 30th. Uh, we're really excited about this launch. We've been preparing it for uh, nearly a year now. So uh, that's uh, that's really good to be to be here today to, to present it to you. Um, First, I'm going to present you a few elements of context uh, about this collaborative. Uh, the idea here is to integrate both international and national issues related to AI and data governance to create standardization strategies that are aligned with Canada's uh, public uh, policy initiatives. Uh, the goal, which is the same for UK, is to help the Canadian AI and data ecosystem to scale up internationally, basically by having uh, harmonized standards. And uh, to achieve this ambitious goal, uh, the collaborative is having representatives from all relevant stakeholders categories in Canada. So industry, of course, but also uh, government, uh, indigenous organizations, civil society, academia, uh, standards development organization, SDOs, uh, and so on. We are, uh, of course, very conscious of the fact that there's always a risk to have industry that, uh, that is overrepresented and an underrepresentation of civil society and we are uh, currently actively looking at ways to mitigate this challenge. All those representatives will work together in the collaborative to basically map out the Canadian needs in AI and data standardization and to identify where the gaps are, what, the, what are the, the standards exactly that we need. Uh, we also aim to participate, uh, of course, in key international standards setting tables and to develop new international work item proposals. Uh, just to give you a number, we are looking to guide the development and implementation of no less than 75 standardization strategies. I won't spend too much time uh, talking about the budget, but the main idea is that we were first thinking of, uh, that we would have two different initiatives, one for AI and one for data governance. And it was then decided uh, um, quite late in the process that it would be better to combine efforts, uh, which would give us the opportunity to merge the two budgets for a total of more or less 17 million uh, of dollars over the next five years. Uh, finally, and this is going to be uh, my last slide, I'd like to take a few seconds to talk about something that's a strong concern uh, for us all today. Uh, the challenges and opportunity of AI and standardization that we are aware of at the Standards Council of Canada. Uh, because, of course, to achieve trustworthy AI, the, the main uh, subject of today's uh, meeting, the collaborative will have to tackle specific challenges. The first one uh, is, as most of you are probably aware of, the, the stochastic structure of neural networks, which is basically what we're talking about when we're talking about AI today, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. So this stochastic structure, uh, meaning its sole probabilities, often results in unexpected behaviors of the systems. Such unexpected behaviors make it uh, difficult to standardize and make it even more difficult to use formal methods for the verification of those systems. Uh, the second problem is the fact that while the global importance and use of AI and data seems to favor the use of international standards, we in Canada have unique Canadian characteristics that standards need to take into account, such as bilingual or indigenous language requirement, for example. 
Uh, the collaborative will have to define areas where standardization should align with international standards and areas, of course, where specific, specific Canadian requirements should be enhanced. The third and last problem uh, that I'm going to, to, to talk about today is one that has been specifically, specifically highlighted by Sandra Wachter's uh, work. Uh, she's a scholar here at Oxford. Uh, it, it is the fact that AI and data principles are, I quote, highly abstract and ambiguous to a point where they are almost useless in practice. And we have indeed a tension between concepts like transparency and privacy. Uh, for example, you can be fully transparent if you need to respect privacy or explainability versus accuracy. And we need to address these tensions uh, between all those AI and data principles and decide which are the one we favor. We won't have a perfect solution, but this challenge constitutes an opportunity to shape AI and data standardization to our unique identity and values, of course. And this is it for me. I'm done. Uh, thank you for your attention and right back at you, Tim. Tom, thank you very much for that. So next up, we have Wael William Diab, who chairs the International Committee in ISO IEC that developed the International AI Standards, which is known as SC42. Wael, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Tim. And before I start, I just wanted to uh, quickly uh, thank uh, BSI and the UK national body for all of the contributions, experts and uh, officers and leadership that we've, um, we have been fortunate enough to receive in SC42. A lot of the projects um, uh, have been uh, greatly uh, either led by or improved through contribution from, from the UK. So thank you for doing that. Um, just briefly acknowledging uh, the whole, I'm going to talk to you about the committee's work, but a lot of people come together um, from S both SC42 as well as uh, from our parents, ISO and IEC, uh, to help the support. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the approach that SC42 is taking. And one of the things that we identified early on was the need for an ecosystem approach. And with that, you know, this diagram and you know all of these slides will be made available to you but one of the things that we realized with uh, technology like AI um, and the associated big data and analytics is that um, you cannot just look at the technology in vacuum so we look at different things that help uh, influence uh, what's going on for example various application domains we also look at a lot at emerging regulatory and policy requirements and you know, probably more so than any other uh, IT technology I've worked on, we are looking a lot at emerging social requirements. And last but not least, you know, business requirements. And with that, we assimilate what we call the context of use of the technology. And from there, if you look at the light green boxes, we develop horizontal and foundational projects. Um, these are not the end of the story, and they are then used either um, by application domains, developing standards, open source, or as we just heard from our uh, colleagues, you know, in Canada through third parties to uh, to implement things like uh, conformity assessment uh, schemes. So the result is really to simultaneously try to accelerate technology adoption while considering, um, you know, the context of use to ensure. Uh, responsible adoption, which I believe is the theme of our um, uh, uh, webinar today. So in terms of the committee itself, we are a committee of both IEC and ISO, and we are under the uh, joint program of JTC1 that looks at information technology. Um, we collaborate with ISO and IEC. Um, the scope of the committee is to serve as the focal point for JTC1 standardization program on AI. So we look at AI from the IT perspective, but we also provide guidance on uh, to JTC1, IEC, and ISO committees developing AI applications. Currently, we have um, 30 active projects and 17 published projects. We have 54 countries that participate, national bodies in the ISO terminology, national committees in the IEC terminology. Um, and we frequently have over 250 delegates that uh, come to our plenaries. We work, we do not work in isolation and we work with a lot of different partners, both internally and externally. We have a quite a um, extensive portfolio of liaisons. 
We also run a workshop uh, on uh, AI twice a year. We're currently organized into five direct working groups and a couple of joint working groups. I'll talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing in each of the areas. So the foundational standards, which is covered by our working group one, uh, completed a lot of the work around the building blocks of AI, including uh, terminology and a framework for using machine learning. They have now turned their attention to um, a series of standards that are looking to enable certification and increasing confidence in the deployment of AI systems. I believe you just heard about ISO IEC 42001, but we also have 42005 looking at system impact assessment as well as uh, 42006, looking at requirements for bodies providing audit and certification. Uh, data is quite a, a big topic for us, and that crosses multiple technologies that we are responsible for, including AI, uh, uh, big data, and associated analytics. And we decided to combine all of this into one group because there's a lot of commonalities, specifically at looking at properties of data. So this group has uh, completed all of the foundational work on big data. We recently published a process management framework for big data analytics, and it's currently focused on an AI data lifecycle framework uh, standard, as well as a multi-part series looking at AI data quality for analytics and machine learning that is currently at six parts. So this is a, quite a novel approach um, to looking at the AI problem from the data side. Uh, working Group 3, I'm not going to say much about because we're fortunate to have the convener, uh, uh, David Philippe, who's going to speak next. Uh, I do want to uh, just note one thing here, which is uh, one of the intents with our approach to trustworthiness is to build on the robust and widely adopted portfolio of ISO and IEC standards related to trustworthiness, and we extend them for AI uh, requirements. This is particularly important because a lot of organizations today already use ISO and IEC standards developed around uh, security, privacy, and trustworthiness like those coming out of SC27. By working closely with standards like that, as well as other uh, standards that are deployed and extending them for the AI-specific needs, uh, we believe that that uh, will help uh, deployment. In terms of ethical and societal issues, you know, this is a colleague of mine at Accenture had pulled this together, talking about where, you know, on the yellow dots, where the focus uh, is um, in these areas. And that mapped very nicely to what we're doing within uh, SC42. So on the one uh, side of the spectrum, we have things like AI-specific trustworthiness issues. On the other end, you know, uh, we we would look at things like policy, which this is uh, outside the scope of SC42, but in between is this area that, that really deals with the context of use of technology that I mentioned earlier. And within SC42, we approach this in two ways, one through direct uh, projects, like the published one that we had on the overview of AI uh, for ethical and societal concerns, and we now have a PWI that David will talk about a little bit more on best practice guidance for mitigating ethical and societal concerns. However, the concept of ethics and societal concerns is very deeply integrated across the entire program. Um, as an example, our governance work, our management system standards, our use cases when we ingest them, we look at ethical uh, issues. So it's not just one or two projects. We also more recently started looking at the positive outcomes or positive implications from a societal perspective on AI with a new project that looks at beneficial AI and an uh, articulating framework. In terms of risk, there's lots of discussion on the approach of risk. You know, from SC42, we support both, uh, you know, uh, life um, um, safety type of risk as well as organizational risk. I think Tim mentioned uh, the publication of our framework recently on uh, risk management. In terms of use cases and applications, this is uh, again an area where we interact with the verticals and um, we have on the use cases side, we published in 2021 over 130 use cases. We now are revising that and we currently are sitting over 185 use cases, but we also have a couple of standards that help um, 
those that are either developing AI applications, look at um, uh, look at the AI specific aspects, or you know looking at you know from an application developer point of view, um, all of our standards uh, together. And those two uh, standards are fairly well along in their development cycle. We recently added uh, to the portfolio of work looking at environmental sustainability aspects of AI, as well as I mentioned, you know, the beneficial AI. Computational methods is at the heart of AI systems. You know, we have a couple of projects here that are published, looking at an overview and tying it to some of the use cases, as well as an assessment of classification performance for machine learning models. Currently, the work here is focused on a reference architecture for knowledge engineering, as well as an overview of machine learning computing devices. The governance implications of AI was a joint work we did with uh, SC40, a sister uh, committee that looks at IT governance. And this is really looking at it from the point of view of uh, uh, someone looking to deploy in a decision-making capacity, what types of questions they might ask and, and answer in terms of the deployment and orchestration of AI. Uh, testing of AI-based systems, by the way, this is a group that is, uh, is run by the UK and is jointly done um, between SC42 uh, as well as SC7. We have a couple of projects here looking at the testing um, of AI-based systems as well as the verification and validation analysis of, uh, of AI systems. Again, adding to the whole portfolio from you know, development as well as certification and now looking at enabling uh, testing. Um, one of our newest groups is a group that we just stood up uh, with ISO TC215 looking at uh, AI-enabled health informatics. Um, this group, uh, again, combines expertise from two groups and uh, we'll start by looking at the state of the art as well as identifying concepts, uh, terminology, and e exemplary use cases uh, in this area. Uh, you heard a lot about the management system standards. I'm not going to uh, get into the details of that. I will mention that it is a novel way to use management systems um, approach to look at the process of the development. It also opens up um, the, uh, the door to third-party certification and audit. And it's not just the 42001 standard, but we also, as I mentioned, have 42005 and 6 that are being developed. And last but not least, you know, this MSS can be extended for what they call a sector specific area or a vertical domain where you can add to the control section um, to address any specific needs from a vertical. Uh, just a brief word on, uh, you know, the, we did an analysis on our support of UN, um, the SDGs. These are the uh, sustainability development goals and we support directly 12 out of the 17 of them. However, through the application of AI, we probably support all of them, and there are some examples here of how we do that. And just to conclude, you know, so we are from, in terms of uh, looking at international standard, we're trying to look at the full AI ecosystem. We are partnering with a number of different um, organizations, both internally and externally, to do that. We have quite a strong portfolio of work with 17 published projects and 30 that are active. Um, it's a great time to engage with us. If you're interested um, uh, to engage, you can reach out to BSI uh, uh, to figure out how you could do that from the UK point of view. And we also have a workshop, which I wanted to briefly touch on. We run this twice a year. The next one coming up is on the 12th and the 14th of June, and we're going to have four tracks. One will uh, do a roundtable around AI applications in the financial application space. We look at um, beneficial AI, novel standardization approaches, and emerging technology and requirements. And, um, you know, there's a link here for how you can uh, how you can join. It's free. Um, our parent IEC also runs an annual workshop on AI with trust. If anyone's interested in that, please don't hesitate to reach out and we'll put you in contact uh, uh, with the uh, proper people. Thank you very much. And I will turn it back to you, Tim. Thank you very much. And I think that all, that's a great presentation to demonstrate the, the massive scope of what's going on uh, already in the standardization and what's to come. So thank you very much for our next speaker. We have Dr. David Phillip, who, as, as a while mentioned, um, convenes the group on uh, working group on trustworthiness. Um, also, before I hand over to David, please keep sending in through your questions. We've got some great questions coming through. So just do that by the Q&A uh, function. Thank you, David. The floor is yours. 
Thank you. Um, great to um, have such excellent four speakers, uh, and they, they they made some great points that I want to uh, react to once my slides start uh, reacting. So I I will uh, speak partially uh, on more general level than while uh, on the JTC one level, you know, about trustworthiness in general, but then uh, partially on uh, more specific level than while uh, that's where where it touches on working group three. That's what uh, while largely skipped. While he actually gave us really good points on us uh, working through gap analysis. You know, the, in working group three, we really concentrate on expanding uh, existing frameworks. That's really true, and that's a great aspect of our systems integration uh, approach as a committee uh, and uh, working group. There is, of course, big demand for um, uh, regulatory demand. And this, uh, that, but regulators really cannot uh, properly regulate. Yeah, it's very hard to uh, formulate uh, verifiable requirements for a regulator if there is no uh, uh, no technical um, uh, criteria, characteristics, uh, metrics, measures, etc. Uh, also, some uh, expectations that the uh, regulators have. Uh, might be kind of naive, you know, because they, they they are asking AI to solve issues that are systemic, and you know, like uh, an ML model, you know, takes over systemic issues for that that have been building up for uh, decades or centuries. It's important to understand that um, uh, regulation should be technology agnostic in a sense that uh, you know what is illegal is illegal, no matter if you use technology to do to do it. And uh, an important point uh, for trustworthiness, it's very important to understand that a, a technical committee such as ours uh, cannot uh, standardize trust. Trust is a psychological or even a religious thing in people. And what, what, we, what we are actually addressing is, you know, actual system characteristics, objective characteristics of systems that make those systems worthy of trust, worthy of trust, right? But we cannot actually make people trust, right? So, so in this sense, uh, the um, trustworthiness is uh, neither uh, necessary nor sufficient condition for, uh, for trust. Uh, but at the same time, it's ontologically proceeding because it's not psychological, it's something that is objectively in the, uh, in the systems, in the AI systems. Um, so, what, to react to Tom and uh, Jacqueline, we are totally aware in 42 that, uh, you know, AIMS uh, addresses the organizational level and uh, we are also aware that the first edition of AIMS uh, w w will not be covering everything, you know, but there's such a big demand you know, that, that there ha has to be something. And uh, AIMS, the organizational certification, you know, like uh, ISO has this ISO CASCO committee that's on conformity assessment in general. And of course, you you can have different conf conformity assessment targets uh, or objects. And uh, in the it, it, we are aware that the first thing that you will be able to certify is an organization. You know, uh, processes in an organization. But we are aware of the gap, and but we are aware that uh, services and uh, product certification is also needed. We are working on that, but it takes time. And uh, one of the frameworks that Working Group 3 um, uh, extends is actually the Square framework uh, of the Systems Engineering Committee's C7 uh, called Square. And uh, that, that was also on the wild slide. We are developing um, AI extension for this, uh, for this quality uh, this is a quality system for product, service, and quality in use. So this actually uh, a baseline or groundwork for uh, for conformity assessment of product. So um, everything I'm talking about is in JTC1. We are a C42 is a subcommittee of JTC1 uh, that was established in uh, 1987. Uh, JTC1 has 23 active subcommittees. 42 is uh, the second youngest um, subcommittee. 
it is one of the system integration entities that's very important yeah we got uh, the, the system integration entities we have seven currently of them uh they are providing the horizontal expect expertise to the whole iso iec uh, standardization ecosystem but not only iso iec but everyone who is uh, who is interested you know in applying uh, the horizontal uh, expertise on on ai machine learning uh, so 42 is one of the seven uh, uh, committees. I, I am, uh, apart from being convener of uh, working group three in 42, I am also a SIF facilitator. Uh, that means someone who helps the system integration uh, uh, entities to deliver their uh, horizontal role. I do it for the other committees, like for the smart cities and IOT. No, uh, I would be in conflict of interest if I was doing that for, for 42. Uh, so those are again the system integration con uh, entities. Working group 13, that's an immediate JTC1 uh, working group, and they developed this uh, uh, very small, uh, I think nine pages, uh, transportiness vocabulary deliverable technical specification published in 2022. This is of course uh, uh, working link, and it will be distributed. You will be able to click on that. I will not do that right now, but what? Well, mm, uh, this is a vocabulary standard that means it is fully visible. It has just terminology and it's fully visible in the preview. You don't need to buy it to uh, to get the uh, the full deliverable. And it, it defines some top level characteristics of trustworthiness, accountability. And those characteristics, this is actually the groundwork. You know, defining those characteristics, this is what you need to do. This is the technical prerequisite for doing product uh conformity assessment anyway, it, it takes longer to develop than the organizational thing because the organizational thing is well established with the uh, management system standards like 9001 27001 now 42001 of course now in 42 uh this is a system integration entity on so, so uh, while gave you this uh, statistics this is basically the same statistics you know what, what we have uh, under development that we have published uh, 36 participating members what uh, sus uh, sustain, uh, sustainable development goals we are uh, contributing to i would dwell for a bit on the liaisons like we have 40 internal liaisons that means 40 other committees and subcommittees in the iso and iec ecosystem are interested in what we are doing they are accessing our documents we actively uh, engage from our end with 29 of them we have 14 external liaisons those external liaisons uh, include very important entities such as ec unesco uh, oecd etac which is the european um uh, europe uh, European labor uh, organizations. So we we really have uh, we are blessed with a really very representative committee that represents societies at large, not just industry. And I think that's really uh, important. So the the seven currently active working groups of uh, of forty two will cover that. Um, and now uh, trustworthiness. So this is active link. Uh, to the uh, 42 work program, uh, this this updates, you know. So um, we are giving you a snapshot in time, but this obviously uh, develops. But this link is always current, so you will be able uh, to follow the program uh, using this link. So this is statistic just for my group, uh, work, working group three trustworthiness. Uh, we have five published projects. Uh, four four of them are pre-standardization technical reports. We uh, big deal. We just published the risk management guidance. While well, already mentioned that, this is one of great examples of our uh, gap analysis approach. You know, we are extending established uh, methodologies uh, that exist in uh, uh, that are established. So uh, our risk management standard is actually AI specialization of the ISO 31000, uh, the general uh, risk, uh, risk management. Uh, so this is our, uh, so far, only published um, standard, like norm normative standard. Uh, we are working on a bunch more. So we have currently eight active projects, 10 uh, current lead editors. Uh, yeah, we, 
three three out of the uh, projects under development are under ballot, so they they cannot be considered active at the moment. Um, so um, this is our publications uh, so far: the TRs, uh, the bias uh, TR. Uh, we we have now a normative follow up uh, for that. Uh, here is uh, the uh, TR um, press standardization uh, non-normative overview for uh, robustness of um, uh, neural networks, and I think this is um, kind of a great reaction to what what Tom said. You know, actually, um, you know, uh, also uh, neural networks can uh, can behave in unexpected way. They are not uh, uh, non-deterministic. And you can actually um, have uh, formal methods over neural networks. So, so the, we, we already published the 20, 24,029 uh, part one, uh, which is just an overview. But we, we are now working on, uh, so the risk just published uh, a month ago in, uh, in, in February. We have two more standards almost published. The um, the Square project uh, that I already mentioned, you know, where, where we 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 develop the um, characteristics of the uh, Square system that is for any uh, IT product or uh, or service or quality in use model, and we are specializing it for AI. So this is the groundwork project, the 25059. This is in PRF. That means immediately before publication this is the last uh, last stage uh, proof you know before publication so this is extremely important you know this enables the uh, everything else that can happen on on product and service uh, certification and uh, the 24 uh, 29 part 2 this is actually a normative standard on formal methods that you can apply how you can formally prove uh, robustness of uh, of uh, neural networks. So it is possible because uh, they are they are mathematically deterministic. They they might behave in an unexpected way, but they are still mathematically deterministic. So um, other projects we have we have a, a collaboration with functional safety people where we uh, work on uh, we we actually work with both notions of risk, which is I think very important. Uh, while touched on that, you know, with the organizational notion of risk based on 31,000 and the IEC uh, or functional safety notion of risk that works basically with the specialized notion of risk uh, as, you know, something causing bodily harm or loss of life. Uh, then we have a normative follow up to the BIAS project again, um, and we have this. Um, Controllability of uh, automated artificial intelligence system project. This is again prerequisite for any any regulatory work that you could do on on human oversight. Uh, again, very very big. So it, w my message here really is, you know, the international standardization community works very hard to deliver tools to the regulators so so that they can really you know do solid. Uh, uh, verifiable, auditable uh, conformity assessment schemes, but it just takes time and it cannot be rushed. If it is rushed, then you can deliver whitewashing schemes, but not certification schemes. Uh, here, the other, the 2558. This is a companion piece to the uh, to the square uh, to to the 2559. 2559. Uh, defines the models, you know, brings uh, defines the characteristics, but the 2558 tells you how to use them for actually evaluating uh, evaluating a system. So this is a second step, you know, to make uh, products and services uh, certifiable. Um, then we have uh, an explainability project. Again, this was uh, called out. Explain. We understand. Controllability, uh, sorry, explainability is extremely important. We have a, a transparency project, taxonomy for trans transparency. Uh, I believe those are extremely important, you know, groundwork projects to, to make uh, product and service um, certifiable. Uh, at the moment, we, we, we don't have anything in just started, but we, 
we have the PWIs, uh, that means preliminary work items. Uh, those are kind of pre-projects where, where we discuss what, uh, what to develop next. And we, we have uh, these societal considerations uh, that could probably be approved for development in April, uh, hopefully, <laughs> we cannot guarantee. But we, we have a very interesting PWI on oversight of AI systems. And this is working, you know, uh, in two streams, I would say. One would be, uh, you know, governance aspects of, uh, of AI, uh, of oversight of AI systems. Uh, that's kind of the top-down approach. And the bottom-up, I mentioned the 80 to 100 uh, TS uh, on controllability. Uh, the, the, the controllability project doesn't uh, talk about human. It talks about controllers or controller agents. But if you want to speak about human oversight, you can build up uh, on this uh, on this controllability project and uh, talk about principles of monitoring by humans or you know uh, uh, using humans as a uh, uh, for oversight over uh, over. Uh, artificial intelligence systems, which is by no means a trivial issue because the, the whole purpose, the whole point of using artificial intelligence systems is that the systems have superhuman capabilities, right? So how to even make their states observable for an operator? So, so the, those, those are big challenges and they need to be first, you know, tackled in the a 8200 and then further, they can be further developed in other uh, projects that are now being discussed in the PWI 18966. We also have a, a road mapping activity that uh, you know prepares uh, further work like uh, next parts to, uh, to to existing series, next editions, uh, normative follow-ups, uh, performs draft, um, gap analysis based on uh, regulatory documents. So we, we, we have a funnel you know, on, uh, on further deliverables that need to be developed in the uh, AI trustworthiness area. And with that, I am done. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, David. Um, that's really, really helpful. And see the questions coming through on that as well. Please keep sending your questions through. Uh, we now have our um, final speaker for the Q&A section. So it's my colleague, Jill Jackson, Senior Research Insight Manager, who's going to provide an overview of some of the uh, research we've been doing uh, specifically around this topic. Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim. Um, hi, everyone. So, yes, yeah, so I'm a researcher at BSI. Um, we conducted some in-depth qualitative interviews with key stakeholders to try and understand a little bit more about the challenges of AI with a view to identifying needs that need to be addressed to ensure industry implement AI in a safe, secure and resilient way. So as a researcher, I'm coming at this probably from a slightly different angle from my fellow speakers, but it's great to hear that there's loads of synergy with, with their activities. So in terms of the, um, the, the research, we spoke to lots of different profiles of organisations, ranging from consultants to developers, through to um, procurers and deployers um, from both large and small organizations. We're really trying to understand the different needs across the different types of profiles. And during the interviews, we focused on the areas of safety, security and resilience to understand their challenges within these specific themes. And safety was very much felt to be the biggest overall challenge area. Uh, and the key question lies around the context of safety. So, for example, is it referring to the safety of AI algorithms or the safety of the outcomes of the usage of AI? And obviously, at the core of this is the obvious consideration of the different levels of risk in applications and outcomes. Participants also highlighted that, you know, we also need to consider that AI works on the basis of correlations. Um, so different models might be equally accurate, but they will predict vastly different things dependent on the training data used. So it's really crucial that context is applied to ensure that the models are fit for purpose and consider the risk and the consequences of a misclassification. Uh, a specific example given was of an insurance policy where it was shown that residents in certain zip codes in America were given credit scores and denied loans due to a correlation in the AI between their zip code and higher risk. 
So although this may have been defined by sort of actuarial fairness, the question is, can you justify the moral outcome of AI by data point correlations? So thinking about security, um, it was recognised that there was a lot of existing standards and guidance out there already um, touching on that. So one concern here was raised about the issue of the misuse of algorithms. We explored the possibility of gaming system, you know, sort of wearing certain makeup or masks to throw off uh, facial recognition software or stickers on stop signs to um, trick self-driving cars. Uh, resilience um, in AI was a bit more complicated. You know, there's lots of strands. You need to think about uh, economic resilience, organizational resilience, information system resilience, human resilience, as well as cyber resilience. And in terms of AI interviews, stress how robustness and repeatability were important factors here, and a consistent output was really sort of a basic requirement. Okay. Um, so in terms of, sort of challenges, there were clearly many and they vary a lot and there are different levels of issues. So the way we saw it right at the top was the kind of question of this ethical and legal compliance. And not only is that considering things like whether you have enough data to build an accurate model, it's also the ethical question of whether you should. Just because you can use AI, should you? And there were plenty of examples where correlations do not seem to provide a fair and moral outcome. So there's some high level applicability decision making that needs to be considered up front. And this can be sort of guided by governance and policy and regulations. And this is also where transparency is critical. So it was very much seen that transparency was essential to tackle the irrational fears and the unrealistic expectations that, that can surround AI. And there's also then the question of context. And ensuring that the model is fit for purpose. So, for example, making sure that any sort of voice recognition software is trained on all accents and dialects. And this comes down to education and skills in the procurers and deployers, so they know what to look for. And then kind of at the bottom, there was this sort of lower level um, of challenges that could be managed by sort of standards and guidance. And these challenges were things like measuring the performance expectations of the model, the choice and quality of the training and the testing data, monitoring and treating the unwanted bias of the model, and also ensuring the sort of longevity over time by logging and monitoring. And it's important to say that throughout this whole process, human intervention should be a key consideration. Um, so for example, ambiguous cases could be directed for human review. And you know, needless to say, although human intervention um, can itself be a point of error, um, all of my research participants did consistently agree that human intervention was essential. So in terms of what does industry need in order to implement safe, secure and resilient AI, there's clearly different needs for the different types of people involved at different stages. So, as I said, ranging from the developers of the models through to the procurement departments, through to the deployers and those implementing AI in their organisation. And in order for AI to be fit for purpose, there should be this transparency around the specifics of the model. So, for example, uh, model labels could be specified, training data could be transparent, the testing data library, a number of tests could be provided to the buyer. And standards would come into play here to define these acceptable levels of performance of the model, perhaps graded by use cases. Um, and it's important to note here that in order to facilitate innovation, these would be outcome based standards rather than prescriptive. So this would provide confidence to procurers. Um, for instance, the standard might say something like, you know, a model is suitable for commercial use if the overall false positive error rate is below 0.5%. And uh, developers should be knowledgeable basically about the whole standards ecosystem. And this is where the AI standards hub and the standards observatory can really help. In terms of the interface between procurers and deployers, um, we found through the research that it's kind of this education. They need a greater degree of education around the legal compliance, the ethical compliance and the context of these AI models in order to help them purchase and deploy ones that are truly fit for purpose. And having spoken with participants, um, they discuss kind of whether e-learning modules or guidance would be, you know, that would be welcome there. And this would be particularly welcome for smaller businesses who obviously might not have dedicated resource in, in procurement departments. 
So that's what we found from the research. Um, there were some certainly some interesting topics raised. Um, and thank you to those on the call who I know um, who contributed. So thanks again. Um, so now I'm going to hand back to Tim for the panel discussion and Q&A where uh, we might touch on some of these areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. If I can ask all the uh, panellists to put their cameras on, please, now. So we've got some great questions that come through, both in advance and uh, online. Please keep sending them through. Um, and we'll try and cover as many of those as we can in the next 25 or so minutes. So I'll sort of start off with um, one of the questions that came through uh, online which is how would 42001 be different from ISO 9001? Um, so ISO 9001, for those on, online who don't know, is the quality management system, which is very, very widely used around the world. Um, and many of these management systems follow a similar uh, structure. I'm not sure if Jacqueline, you're probably the best person to come in with your recent work um, around with the certification bodies around that. Uh, I can start, absolutely. One of the key differences is just the specificity around AI, actually. So 9001 ends up being a high-level quality management system guidance and set of requirements, whereas 42001 has the specific flair of artificial intelligence for machine learning. So picture everything that's in 9001 just tweaked a little bit more for AI. Um, well, Ellen, you, you want to come in on that as well? Yeah, no, I, I think actually, uh, no, Jacqueline's correct. I, the only thing I would add is within uh, the ISO family, you know, manage when you go for management system standard, there's an additional step of approval where there's a group that is specifically fo focused on MSS, and um, and so you know if if for example someone is familiar with nine thousand and one but doesn't know much about forty two thousand and one, you know, rest assured that you know we we go through um, anyone that's developing an MSS with an ISO has to go through that um, through that step as well. Uh, David, I don't think you're on mute. Uh, just a very small point. Uh, all the uh, management system standards are based on the same template. Uh, it, it means they, they there are no they are not layered. You know, uh, so you can combine any number of management system standards and you, you will not do anything superfluous. So, so they are all compatible, but they are testing something else, you know, like uh, indeed what, what Jacqueline said, uh, AIMS is specific for AI. And uh, in Ireland, we did some uh, research on that, you know, in our national body. And we, we figured that many of the SMEs that would use 42001 they actually don't have and don't plan to have uh, 9001. So, so they, they are uh, meaningfully different. But they are both quality management systems, of course. Uh, I mean, the only final point I would make is that um, we'll see how this, how we'll see how this rest of this year plays out. But I think the there are lots of firms that would be interested in 42001 could have 27001, the cybersecurity framework in place, yeah, probably, right, more yeah. so, probably more so in the quality management framework. Yeah. Um, so, the next question is probably um, most most best directed towards um, Tom. So, the question is, can someone from the US participate in this collaborative, so the work you mentioned earlier on? But I mean, just more broadly, I mean, how how do you see that the scope is being? Because obviously, I mean, what we're doing, you know, nominally UK based, but international, I'm sure that you'll have a similar approach from Canada. So, interested to hear how that's, um, where, where you're seeing the scope of that in terms of uh, Canadian nationals and beyond. Well, the idea is, re is really to <clears throat> find a solution to align uh, with the Canadians' policy uh, regarding AI and data governance. So we have a lot of different uh, different projects uh, going on in in Canada. Uh, the Bill C27, which is basically a whole package of laws, uh, we are going to create basically a tribunal. Uh, we are having we are having our own. Uh, law on federal law uh, for AI, which is called ADA, um, which is kind of a, a response to the uh, European Union um, AI Act. Uh, so we we are currently trying to find some ways for our collaborative to um, support the implementation of C27 of this whole package of laws. 
uh, uh, directed to, to, to AI. And as you know very well, the uh, European AI Act is giving a lot of uh, strength to um, Sensadelic and to basically AI standardization. And we are trying to find a way to adapt to this kind of uh, um, strategy from, from the European Union, which is really interesting, but we, 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 we are in need of uh, having an answer um, uh, on, on that specific point. Right now, we don't have specific mention of standardization in uh, C27, in our, our, our whole package of laws regarding AI, uh, but we might have a mention of standardization that will come uh, a, a bit later. I don't know if that's, uh, that answers your, your question. Or the thank, thank you very much, Simon. I mean, there's also, as you mentioned about the EU uh, AI Act, and there are questions around that that come in as well. It's also worth mentioning at this point, if you go onto the AI Standards Hub, there is a webinar specifically about what's happening around the standardization and how that fits with the EU AI Act, which is still um, coming through in draft. Uh, so the next question I'll probably sort of point towards uh, Jill, if you are uh, able to cover this one. So it's one thing that came in through in advance, which I think you may have had to cover in the research. So can you provide some further clarity on the definition of what constitutes AI? Um, when does an ordering computer program become AI? Because I imagine in the research you've had to have this discussion as well. So do you have any views on that from your experience? Um, yes, and it, it's it ranged. So some some participants very much just saw AI as software and it's kind of, that's one end of the spectrum. Um, and then you've got the more sort of advanced levels at, you know, at the other end, you know, it's machine learning, it's much more kind of, much more um, advanced and and I think that's almost where the um, the, the spectrum of, of confusion comes in for a lot of outsiders if you like who aren't as familiar with it it's you know and as a few participants you know there's been a lot of mainstream media and films and things which are just terrifying people out there it's all sort of sentient you know software so it, it really does vary and I think that's why it comes back to the education something that's really transparent and clear that, that can try and, you know, it's got to be this midpoint where you've got to understand the risks, but equally not be totally fearful of it and know when it's applicable. I think that's the key message. Yeah, I mean, I was also from potentially David and Whale, whether I imagine the definitions of AI are something that you've had to deal a huge amount with in SE42. So do you have a different, different perspective, David? I uh, my my take is that the regulator pushes a very wide uh, you know notion of AI and actually this very wide notion of AI actually also prevailed in our working group one when uh, when developing the 20 uh, the, 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 mm, the core concept and terminology project and well I, I don't think it's necessarily wrong you know like I, I think, there has been a gap in uh, uh, doing conformity assessment for software-only products. So I think that the uh, regulator kind of try, uh, are trying to push to uh, certify software in general rather than just AI. You know? Definitely the a a EU Draft Act um, interpretation is much wider than what we consider AI. You know, they, they include like statistical methods or uh, you know, things that wouldn't be considered AI. But I don't think it's necessarily wrong, you know, like, I mean, the, the you know, what you are trying to protect human rights, right? In, in the, you are trying to protect consumer, a citizen from misuse of the technology. And you don't necessarily care if it was do, uh, done doing, a, you know, using a Bayesian network or, uh, or deep learning. You know? I, mean, I mean, the other point I'll say around the definitions is I think, you know, as um, I can't remember which of you, your presentations it mentioned about you know, foundation work, standardization. That's one of the things that in the standards process comes on quite early on. But I think the definition of AI has come back to the fore recently because it affects particularly the EU AI Act, what is going to be regulated and what isn't going to be regulated. Um, so another question probably back to Jacqueline again, but so come back to some of your pilot work. So the question is um, that EU, EU 
Ernst & Young's role in it and whether EY is accredited to ISO 17011. And I think it's may come about from that. I don't think e, I don't think EY is a certification body in the UK, but it is in other countries. So just want to get more about how what happened with the process of um, that particular certification body and other certification bodies in the future by, by the pilot. Please. Yes, absolutely. So just to clarify, 17011 is actually what we as accreditation bodies need to be aligned and compliant to. So that's almost like the, the highest echelon of requirements so that an accreditation body is allowed to go certify the certifiers. Hence that weird pyramid scheme, which is a terrible term. <laughs> but basically what uh, any organization would need to do to prepare for this, to be able to issue certificates for 42001 specifically, is to become accredited under that management system umbrella, which we were talking about for 9001 is in one example. The um, information technology is another one, privacy like PIMS and now AIMS, uh, AI management system. So that all falls under this management system umbrella, which for an organization means they need to be compliant with what's called ISO 17021. So that's what they need to do to have the power to give out management system certificates. So any organization looking to give out management system certificates is ISO IEC 17021-1. It's pretty nuanced, but then underneath that are subsets for if you're interested in doing business continuity, quality management, et cetera. There are a whole series, as David mentioned, they're similar but different, and that's so, the first step for an organization. Just to mention, this is governed by ISO CASCO. This is a policy committee uh, that, uh, you know, develops these standards about conformity assessment, you know, like, so, so uh, th this is kind of who, who watches the watchers, you know, so it's ISO CASCO. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. I want to sort of cover a few sort of questions that come in online and beforehand around sort of stakeholder groups. So probably the sort of broader one that came through in advance, or three sets of questions. So how does how do how do standards take into account the perspectives of smaller developing countries, and what efforts are made to involve the consumer view in standards development and trustworthy AI? And thirdly, how can regulators support the development of AI standards? Um, so probably so that that's the perspective for you know so three internationally looking at the, how um, developing countries get involved, especially smaller ones, and how we ensure consumers and um, other groups like regulators stay involved. So probably start with uh, what else sort of covering from the, you know, particularly the sort of the breadth of countries involved in SE42, and maybe sort of some of the rest of us talk about um, the other um, perspectives coming in. So do you, do you have a, could you want to explain to those who are unaware of how um, smaller countries get involved in the standardization system? Yeah, so actually, you know, from within ISO and, and IEC, any member country can, can join uh, SC42. And you can join in two capacities. You can join as uh, either what we call a P member or an O member. So an O member is an observer. That could be something where you're not quite sure, you know, how engaged you want to be, but you want to be able to observe. Or in some cases, um, regardless of the size of the country, they can use that um, status while they um, while they're trying to figure out uh, setting up, for example, their mirror committee. Um, so that's you know that's one aspect. The other aspect I would say that we've seen within SC42 that's been um, quite nice is the fact that it's not only the countries that are predominantly developing IT that have joined, but we've had um, you know pretty much all of the regions represented because you know if you look at the technology from the point of view of who's going to use AI, it's anticipated that um, many will. So. We do have that representation. We have countries of all sizes in there. I also think the question about the uh, consumer aspect is very interesting. So early on, uh, we did uh, reach out to, within ISO, there's a group called Capulco that looks at the consumer uh, area. And we, um, um, we've, e we've even had a pre presentation from someone that works with Capulco and Consumers International in one of our workshops. And, um, you know, Fortunately, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, like trustworthiness or um, oh, there's a little typing in the background. I'm not sure if um, maybe it's not someone's not on mute. Um, we we've seen that that crosses over 
quite well into um, you know, all aspects of AI, whether you're looking at it from an enterprise development point of view or from a consumer point of view. The last aspect I would say is we've also worked very hard to develop relationships. I think David mentioned this earlier with organizations like UNESCO. So for example, I participate on the UNESCO expert group looking at the implementation of, um, of their AI uh, resolution that they took. Uh, we work closely with other groups like OACD. Um, and so, you know, it's been a way where we've used the um, capability within um, an ICE or IEC committee to, to develop a liaison, but extended it um, to be able to work with uh, groups that may be interested in the topic, but not maybe primarily, primarily interested in sending you comments on what a draft looks like, but instead, you know, looking to see how, how we can work together. And that's been uh, been very effective. Another organization that um, IEC is a member of, um, which I believe right now BSI is the secretariat, is Oceanus, that's looking at um, uh, basically the ethical aspects of AI. So um, by working through um, such, um, building those types of relationships, um, the not only do we get different perspectives uh, when we develop the standards but it also allows for our standards to be um, a tool um, for someone that's looking to bring uh, context around their deployment of ai fantastic thank you and i know from um from the uk perspective we also have a, a group that called CPIN that ensures it's independent funded that ensures that consumer reputation is, is representation is involved and also i think for some of the some of the approach to the UK has taken, which came up in one of the questions, so I'll cover it now about um, how AI will be regulated in the UK. There's going to be the focus is going to be towards individual regulators, and there's going to be another um, government document out soon that provide more details. And we've had very good representation from the regulators onto our UK committee, and we're very welcoming of that. And I think it's a great um, approach they're taking. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Tom or Jacqueline want to talk about how some of the representation comes through in Canada. We had a specific question, which would also be good for you to, to cover, which I'll just find. Um, so I found it very relevant that Canada is considering the perspective of Indigenous people in developing AI standards. Would, lo would like to know more about the strategies used for this participatory approach and also specific challenges it presented. I think that'd be useful for, for all the other standards bodies as well, to be honest. Um, Jacqueline and Tom, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to start in Jack and you, you, you go ahead. Um, so that's that's a really interesting question. And, and, and that's, to be honest, that's that's quite a specific challenge we have in Canada because we don't have a lot of uh, indigenous people who are having the expertise or and the resource to 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 work uh, or give the provide an expertise in uh, in AI and in AI standardization, of course. So that's that that that's really one of the key challenges we we need to be able to address with uh, the collaborative. Um, one way to do so is to 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 go through uh, some key organization uh, national associations uh, who are. Uh, representing uh, indigenous people in the areas of uh, IT and digital at large. Uh, so those associations, those national associa indigenous associations uh, have um, uh, a specific expertise that uh, can be leveraged uh, in order to, 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 to help us in the collaborative uh, to, to, to really mind the, the gaps. Uh, we have a lot of different initiatives regarding uh, also the the specific issue of uh, indigenous uh, data sovereignty, because we basically can't uh, have uh, AI systems that use indigenous data uh, without uh, regarding and protecting uh, the, the the specifics of, of of this kind of data. Uh, so the whole idea of the collaborative is also to 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 uh, serve and help as a, a, a way to reconciliate uh, the, the Canadian people with uh, the Indigenous people. And we, we, we are really hopeful that uh, um, the Colab is going to be successful in that. Jacqueline? 
Yeah, um, I think that's perfect. And what is nice because conformity assessment typically follows later down the line in terms of leveraging the cohort that the collaborative can identify. That's where the standard side of the house where Tom is maps really closely to the accreditation side where I sit. Thank you for that. Uh, I now I'm sort of jump. I'm sort of jumping around slightly, but uh, a question that's come in. Um, just for those new to AI, where's the best starting point for standards in AI? And probably point that to sort of uh, Weil and, and David because I mean, you presented a lot of standardization that's happening and coming. So someone uh, someone who's new to AI and new to standards, where would you point them to, to starting from? David, do you want to come in first? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, it depends on what's your objective, right? Like if you, if you want to, you know, certify your organization, then start with AIMS. Uh, if you, you know, if you are interested in, you know, uh, certifying, you know, a quality model for your for a product, then probably start with Square, right? 25,051. But of course, you will not make a mistake if you start with 22989, which is the general uh, terminology and concept framework. And it, it, it is kind of, it is 23053, this is the uh, machine learning framework. So those are basically the two first normative deliverables that mainly deal with the with the concept framework you know explain basic concepts like uh, what, what is an ai system uh, you know what is um, say narrow ai you know uh, what, what is knowledge uh, knowledge engineering nlp it explains basic concepts you know so so you you won't make a mistake if you start with 22989 <laughs> And 22989 is actually normative import, you know, terminology from that is normative import in pretty much every other deliverable in 42. While you want to develop on that. I mean, I, I'll, I'll just add a couple, no, I, I agree with what you said. I, I'll just add a couple of points. I think one, you know, if you're new to standards, by all means, reach out to your national body, right? That's, um, that's a very good way, you know, uh, to, to get started. And in many cases, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we've got, at least four, 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 four different national bodies represented. So um, you know that's a that's a good way to start. Um, if it's something specific to SC42, if you reach out to any one of the officers, we can put you um, in contact with someone. Um, the other thing I would say is um, for you know the work that we're doing in ISO and IEC, we have these uh, biannual workshops that we're running, and those are all archived. They're actually produced through the IEC Academy. Um, and you can go back and look through the presentations. So one of the things that we do is every time we have we we get so we talked about MSS, we have a deep dive, um, and it's there's a video recording, there's the presentation that's on there. Uh, you can take a look, um, and certainly you know uh, from I think the slides that everyone put together today, that's that's not a bad way. And um, I, I think the um, from you know having learned about it from one of our workshops the standards hub is is also a great way to to learn about what's going on so in my slides every every uh, standard reference is clickable it takes you directly to the online browsing platform to to that particular standard you know okay. I think, so maybe this might be our last or penultimate uh, question so we've got quite a few questions about um healthcare and medical devices so what the end of this end of the um, webinar I'll reference some some other um, forthcoming webinars. So the question is is, is is again very much relates to, to regulation itself. I'm not sure if any of any of us can, can answer this one. But what management system standard would trump for an for an AI um, ML medical device? So ISO 13485, which is uh, quality management for the medical devices sector, or ISO IEC 42001. Does anyone have a perspective on that? Well, yeah, I could take some of this. So again, I would refer to the uh, the second workshop we had. We actually had a roundtable around AI and healthcare, and a couple of committees like IEC TC62 and ISO TC210 uh, were represented, and we had quite a detailed discussion on this. Um, and so. What the path will be is, um, uh, you know, for medical devices, like any domain, um, they have to make their own uh, assessment. Um, 
uh, we are in discussions with with those groups in terms of um, p potentially collaborating about on that. So I want to be a little bit careful um, not to over or under commit. But if I take sort of a little bit a step back and I look at generically what is going to happen with the different domains, and I think we've all touched on this, I think, in our various comments. Number one, you know, you know, regulation, there may be regulation around the horizontal aspect, but ultimately for each domain, there's also, um, whether it's regulation or there's industry uh, norms that are expected, will go there. So the story is not going to end with, you know, just what SC42 does. Um, but each of the each of the domains themselves, and I think even from a very simple point of view, you know what what each um, you know the word AI we have a standards definition for it, um, but I think what people interpret um, as AI will also be a little bit different depending on their uh, application perspective. So when you look at a particular domain, you know whether or not they decide to pick up and use a lot of the SC42 deliverables as is, that's one choice. Uh, with the MSS itself, it can be extended uh, to different verticals, or it could be that they incorporate some of the concepts that have been developed in SC42 within their own framework of standards that they use, right? So it'll be a little bit different on the medical device stuff. Um, what I would say is, you know, um, uh, uh, please stay tuned because something, you know, we're working with them and hopefully uh, something will come about. Thank you. Uh, I, I would have just very short, you know, they were asking about product certification. So you, with any uh, any management system standard, you, you cannot address product certification. It's a different conformity assessment target, you know. Uh, MMS is inherently address processes in organizations. So uh, all what Val said about verticals and horizontals, that's true, but you also need to keep in mind what is your certification target, right? Like, uh, and uh, well, as we said, as I said before, like we are not ready for product and services certification yet. We are working on it, but we don't have the schemes yet. You know, uh, AIMS is, yeah, the processes in organizations is the first thing that will be certifiable in, in the RAI, I would say. Thank you. I think unfortunately we've run out of time to ask um, any more questions. I had a couple of great ones I wanted to, to, wanted to ask, but, um, but I want to thank all our, our speakers for um, the time today and giving us so much effort in terms of all the questions we've had and also everyone online for all the questions that come through. So to bring today to a close, I just want to thank all our speakers. So Jacqueline, Tom, David, Weil and Jill. And also thank you my uh, BSI colleagues for putting some hard work into the conference together. So as I've said it before, but this uh, event today is developed as part of the AI Standards Hub. So please go to the AI Standards Hub site, which is aistandardshub.org, and register for the newsletter as well. Um, please keep an eye out for the various webinars in development. There have been a few points that come through in the questions about uh, the healthcare sector and ethical use of AI. So there's a specific um, webinar on the British Standard that's recently out on that, so 30440. So please register for that. I would also, as I mentioned earlier on, be doing uh, two uh, full uh, AI conferences this year, and there's other ones around cybersecurity and various other uh, topics. So BSI will be sending a follow-on email after the conference with the link to the recording and the presentation today. At the end of the conference, you will be taken automatically to the feedback survey to complete. This will also be sent again in the follow-up email if you happen to miss it. Thank you all, and thank you, thank you to our speakers again. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you.